going to welcome our guests to the screen. Remember, you can put your questions for them in the chat whenever, uh, whenever throughout this, this sort of presentation. And we're going to try to get to as many of your questions as possible. Uh, first up, we have Ms. Shea or Aaron, PhD student at Johns Hopkins University. She researches sulfates in Martian craters using remote spectroscopy. There's that word again. Ms. Shea, welcome. And then our Hi second there. guest today, our second guest today, sorry, Misha, uh, our second expert today is Jane Nadeau. She's an associate professor at Portland State University, and she studies nanoparticles and the development of scientific instruments to detect life elsewhere in the solar system. Jay, so happy to have you. Yes, great to be here. Thank you. So we have both of you here today. And Misha, I just gave a very, very quick glimpse of you and your work, but can you give us a brief like one minute elevator synopsis, not that any of us are in elevators much right now, of what you're working on right now. Sure thing. So um, just like what Christy said, um, so I study um, um, remote spectroscopy as a fourth year PhD student at Johns Hopkins. Um, so my work specifically um, looks at um, Sorry. So I'm looking at these particular minerals called sulfates, and these type of minerals are they're hydrated minerals. And um, the reason why I'm studying them is because um, typically we would find them in environments um, that um, would be uh, conducive to their formation. So they like spicy water. I call acid acidic <laughs> conditions spicy water. Um, but we're not mm -hmm. finding them in like geologic units where they would be, uh, where the environment would be like that spicy water. So. Mm -hmm. um, um, so that's basically been the bulk of my research. Um, I'm using uh, remote sensing IR spectroscopy and soon hopefully some in-situ spectroscopy too. Awesome. And we'll get to that in a, just a moment. And then Jay, what can you give us? A, give us a quick introduction in your own words about you and your research. I said nanoparticles, but, but what are you doing with those nanoparticles? Yeah, so basically um, my group develops tools and techniques for studying microorganisms in extreme environments. And the tools can be things like fluorescent labels, so things like nanoparticles. And the techniques can be forms of microscopy, forms of spectroscopy, any sort of way to look at organisms in some sort of extreme environment, whether that be under the ocean, on another planet, or even inside the human body. So if you think about the bacteria that live in your periodontal pockets, that's very similar in some ways. None so of us has periodontal to... pockets. That's right. <laughs> we hope not. Yeah, it, it's more disgusting than you can imagine. But um, the, that same question is, is very similar to, say, looking for bacteria in rocks in Death Valley or even on Mars. Amazing. Well, we're going to hear more about that too shortly, um, but we're going to dive in first. Miche, I'm really excited to hear more about uh, remote IR spectroscopy. Go ahead and uh, the stage is yours. Absolutely. So hi, guys. Um, I'm really excited by talking about this. And um, because this is something that I absolutely love talking about, I'll try not to ramble too much when it comes to um, spectroscopy. But um, we're going to talk about how you can observe the unobservable using um, spectroscopy, and how it can also be used to find, you know, uh, evidence of life as well, possibly. So um, a lot of you guys, you are currently like, you know, looking at the screen, then you can see the importance of seeing. Seeing is how we're able to operate, to understand the world that we live in. And without our sight, then it can be very difficult for us to understand or to, um, I guess, conceptualize the world around us. And so as a scientist, I rely heavily on my own sight to study the surface of Mars. And this is just a really cool photo of Mars that I like to share because you can see all these weird, strange colors that you don't typically see if you see Mars from far away. Um, but um, this importance of sight is just how, how I like to connect what I do to, um, um, to how, you know, how everyday people you know, function um, in their world around them. So you know, it's important for us to look at the unobservable because it can tell us a lot more than what we can see. You know, uh, there's more than meets the eye. Well, you can actually use that philosophy with um, the surface of Mars. So how do we observe the unobservable? Well, it actually takes a team. And so what you guys are looking at now is a picture of the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And this Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter is actually, it's been around, it's been orbiting around Mars since 2015. Um, but there are three instruments there um, that actually help make this, um, the observing the unobservable uh, much more tangible. And I'm going to talk about those three instruments. So the first two I'm going to talk about 
are more related to things that we can actually see with your own eyes, right? And so this is high rise or high resolution imaging science experiment and also CTX, which is context camera. And they're both are actually used just to give context to what we are actually looking at in comparison to what we're gonna see with the third instrument that I'll talk about. But high rise is actually really cool because um, the pixel resolution, so each tiny pixel that you would see um, in an entire picture from high rise, each pixel is around one foot per pixel. So it's actually really interesting that we can see so much detail. Um, we can zoom in and see a lot of detail. And CTX is actually around 26 feet per pixel, which is close to like the size of a bus. So you can tell, you can see that these two images are actually very important for us to understand you know, the surface of Mars. In fact, this is a really cool photo from high rise. This is actually a, a dust devil, a dirt devil. I can't remember the exact word for it, but basically a, a sand tornado. <laughs> and so this is some of the images that um, you would actually get. This is actually the three images from like my own research too. And so um, this is um, these really high resolution images. If I zoom in, I can see so much detail. And so, Give me a second, my computer, there we go. And so the third imager or the third instrument that I use, this is the most important one, this is PRISM. And this is the Compact Reconnaissance Imaging, Reconnaissance, Reconnaissance Imaging Spectrometer for Mars. And so this third, image, this third imager is actually, the pixel size is around 60 feet per pixel. So about the size of a bowling lane. And so this one's very, very important um, because, um, uh, this one allows us to see the unobservable to compare to what we can see with those other two instruments. And this is just to show you the size comparison of these instruments. They're really big. They look like they're about the size of a Nikon, but they're actually not. So these are the images that I have here um, of what PRISM looks like. This is not what Mars actually looks like. We know that Mars is not blue. I wish it was, but it's not. But the fact that we're able to see these little blue strips and these little splotches of cyan, that's because like there are different minerals there that's kind of like shine through um, through the other uh, what we can actually see through all the other rocks that very similar to these rocks. And so this is all important because this kind of leads into this very special field that makes this all happen. It's called spectroscopy. And so spectroscopy. Um, is just the study of how light interacts with objects. And light can interact with objects in three different, actually they can, they can interact with more than just three, but I'm gonna use the three because these three here are actually the most important for how PRISM is able to work. So light can, when it interacts with an object, it can either absorb, an object can absorb light like a sponge, it can reflect it like a mirror, or it can transmit kind of like um, this character from X-Men that can actually go through walls. I can't think of the power, but it's actually kind of cool. Either way, these three things that light can do actually make it really make it possible for us to study um, what's happening or how we're able to identify different rocks. And so um, the reason why I'm showing you the electromagnetic spectrum is because uh, two of these things here, are what's gonna make all of this happen, the visible light and the infrared. You guys are already familiar with visible light if you're looking at this presentation now, um, but you may or may not be familiar with infrared depending on how much exposure you have to like different types of technology. Um, with infrared light, infrared is actually really, really important because this allows us to get the information that we're seeing with those images of rocks, those, that cyan that we're seeing, that's related to that infrared. And I'll explain to you why in a moment. But in short, visible light's important because when light hits an object, anything that's reflected back is going to hit our eye. And that's how we're able to perceive color. Anything that's not reflected back is absorbed, right? Just like those three images that I showed you. But with um, infrared, it's actually not, well, we don't, we don't really see what's happening, right? Like, we don't know, are we seeing the colors? Like, how do we know that anything is even interacting with objects? Well, just because you can't see it, it doesn't mean that nothing is happening. In fact, this is actually, oops, actually, there we go. Perfect. Okay, this is actually um, one of the major um, components to how we're able to um, use CRISM to identify these different rocks. And so what happens is we have our light interacting, uh, light from the sun interacting with the rocks on the surface. And you can almost kind of think of it as of rocks, or actually, I'm sorry, you can almost think of that light, that energy, kind of like music. If you're ever on a car, on a road trip with your friends, 
And so that light will interact with those rocks, those molecules within the rocks. And let's say some of the molecules like jazz, or maybe sometimes the molecules like R&B, maybe they like rock, who knows? Classic rock is always a good one. Those are rocks, haha. Anyway, so as these as energy hit these rocks, they start to vibrate or they start to bend and stretch. Well, not all of that energy is going to be absorbed. Some of it is reflected back. So let's say maybe they don't actually like, um, um, I don't know, rock and roll, maybe, who knows? Rock, but not rock and roll. So that's just reflected back. This is called reflectance spectroscopy. And this is actually really cool because we actually get to create this really interesting, interesting graph from this, from our instrument on PRISM. And so what we see in this graph are these little dips. These little dips are where this energy is absorbed by these molecules. And get this, these molecules are actually a combination of different elements that make up this rock. And so we're able to identify these different rocks from these little dips, these absorptions, and use these as like diagnostic tools, kind of like how you're able to use your fingerprints as a way to identify a person. And so with this information, we can actually create this really cool color scheme, a scheme that we see here, where we're taking different little characteristics of rocks, like, hey, I'm looking for some iron, or I'm looking for some carbon, or I'm looking for a rock that has water in it. And those molecules actually vibrate at a particular wavelength. We can put this in a red, green, blue combination and highlight different places on Mars where we can see these features. Doesn't mean that the rock of that nature is there. It just means that it could possibly be there because sometimes there are other rocks that have all three of these features too. And of course, we can look at this image that we've created and then we can collect these little dips and actually identify um, what these minerals are by comparing them to rocks that we have on Earth. And this is how we're able to do this type of analysis. And then of course, if we know what this particular area is based on the matching of the spectra, we're able to draw out a particular spot on the surface of Mars and create a really cool map like this. This is actually one of my maps that I made, um, trying to map out all the different mineralogy of this crater. And so this is just how spectroscopy is able to like lighten up our life. We're able to identify all these rocks. And even if we were just to look at a normal image of this crater, we would not be able to see this diversity because of how much rocks look the same in the visible light. And so as a planetary science, how, why is this important? Why is it important that I'm able to shoot lasers at rocks and then get a cool squiggly graph and then make a little spinning paint design thing to you know draw where rocks are right well as a planetary scientist so as um christy mentioned i study these type of minerals called sulfates and these sulfates are actually kind of important because they're supposed to be in a particular rock region of mars where the conditions were right at the time for those rocks to form there's three geologic periods of mars there's noachian hesperian and amazonian and so with each of those eras we have different environments wet and warm for noachian a little bit tropical right nice for life if you would have life um then you have hesperian which is wet and acidic so like i said the spicy water and then you have your dry environment which you know which created the red color that we see from Mars today. And so if we're seeing sulfates in clays or surrounded by other clays or in a rock region that's supposed to have warm and wet, but these rocks need you know, acidic environments to form, you, you kind of wonder, well, how did you get there, right? It's like trying to, it's like finding your shoe in your pile of your laundry. It's like, who put the shoe in my pile of laundry? And like, we're able to like figure out like, we know that this rock is embedded in this geology because of where it's located. This is a cute little drawing I made of how we're able to know. So usually whenever you look at, you know, craters, you see um, uh, like the materials in certain locations, right? And depending on where they were before the impact will determine um, if they were older or like in a deeper part of the rock or if they're closer to the surface. And so um, this is important because, you know, there's this thing called law of superposition where older things are on the bottom, younger things are on top. Last week's dirty laundry on the bottom, yesterday's on top. And so we're seeing last week's dirty laundry on the bottom and then spreading out in different parts of the crater. I know this is a lot of information. I'm trying to condense it down as best as I can. There's a lot of um, fun things about it, but I kind of like to, to sum it up as just, you know, time traveling rocks, right? You know how Marty McFly is like, going back to the 1950s but he doesn't clearly doesn't belong there and so he's just surrounded by all these different you know rocks that he knows he's not at the same time period so time traveling rocks 
eh, probably not time traveling, but definitely something geologically interesting is happening, especially may have happened in that era to make these rocks appear um, with these other rocks that do belong in that geologic unit. And so by doing so, I'm able to figure out if the crust of Mars is kind of mixed like a smoothie or if it's mixed like, you know, a parfait because you know you can't just have like a random rock like that that doesn't really work well with that type of environment uh, will form in that type of environment to just suddenly appear like that. There's way more to the research and everything, but hopefully I'm able to like explain this thoroughly. But well, um, Miche, I think, and we do have some mm -hmm. good questions actually. If you wanna, if you're ready okay. for that, I don't know if I missed a. Oh, if you have a, one more slide to to do. Oh well, actually, I kind of do have one more slide. Yeah. Um, basically bringing it back to like, why is it important for you guys? Sorry if I was talking forever. Um, but, you know, with regards to um, uh, the technology that we're using, so remote, remote spectroscopy. So with new discoveries comes new technology. We can actually thank NASA for a lot of the things that we have um, today is te technologically. So the reason why you have cameras on your camera phone is because of an invention that happened back in like the early nineties, where they wanted a really small camera um, for, Flighter, um, for fighter jet pilots, I can't get the name right all the time. But basically, from these new scientific discoveries, we're able to improve our technology to help us with um, analyzing, studying um, different things. And of course, you guys benefit from it because this technology isn't just exclusive to NASA or other space agencies. You guys get to utilize it as well. So yeah, that's basically it. Um, just using what we can, we can use things we can see to observe things that we cannot see, um, thanks to spectroscopy. Shay, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, I feel like uh, several of our listeners are walking away with brand new metaphors uh, to try to explain these things. Uh, we do have a question from Steve in California, who's just wondering if CRISM is using only the infrared spectrum. So that's a good question. So we're using visible near infrared. So um, we the instrument actually goes from about um, about 400 nanometers to about 4,000 nanometers. And that's like near the tail end of the visible spectrum, slightly, slightly, depending on how picky you are about where UV is, into like near infrared. It's still near infrared. It's near infrared. I think it's near infrared into, oh man, I need to know this off the top of my head. But basically, it's still very much in near infrared. Um, but yeah, near infrared and visible. How do you pick the, uh, you personally, how, how, how do um, scientists decide what wavelength of light to use for a particular instrument? That's a good question. I guess it depends on what we're studying. So infrared is actually really good for, um, for looking for minerals in particular. And the reason for that is because um, the molecules actually respond very well to um, the infrared energy level that's used for making the rocks move around. In fact, visible, well, some parts, I think it's the, it's the visible very, it's like right at the border of visible and infrared. Um, there's actually this process called um, electronic processes where electrons like to, you know, pass electrons to each other like they're playing volleyball. And so that's how we're able to like detect um, minerals that have iron or titanium or any of those transition um, um, metals. Um, so it just depends on what we're looking for. Um, but mm -hmm. you wouldn't use infrared to um, say, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. So you wouldn't use um, infrared to, um, I guess, look for, um, hmm. actually, let me just use this analogy. You wouldn't use infrared to look at your bones entirely. You would use x-ray, right? Because it actually can penetrate the skin and then you can actually see the bone structure. Right, but um, it just it just depends on the uh, molecules and how they like to react to different wavelengths. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Bar Barbara has a question. She's from South Carolina. She's just wondering where exactly your cameras are located, and I think we can also ask um, like how far above Mars is is this satellite? Are there parts of the planet that it can't actually ever see? Like, does it its orbit cover the whole planet, or are there blind spots? So yeah, uh, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, how far up is it? So as far as I know, okay, so I'm gonna have to get back to you on the how high up it is, mm -hmm. but as far as like its coverage, so technically um, 
Chrism is um, pass uses this technique called passive remote sensing. So there's active and passive. But active is it's using its own energy. So like it's shooting a laser just to pick up that detection from that laser. But passive is it's using the power of the sun to detect things. And so it can only, well, yeah, it can only collect information during the during Martian day. So um, typically around, they say it's like around three o'clock and I'm trying to think. Um, so typically around three o'clock-ish Mars time is when we typically gather that data. And so, mm -hmm. you know, like it's, it's five o'clock somewhere. Like, yeah, like <laughs> it, as long as it's following, you know, the trajectory or like staying mm -hmm. in that particular orbit to where it's like in that three o'clock range of Mars, mm -hmm. then that's when it's collecting that data. So it's like basically following that turn that orbit mm -hmm. around mars uh, was there another question that uh, oh are there any blind spots question? um like is there is there anything that uh, mro can't see mm, so i have to think about that one as well because right now my brain is telling me that i know that there are spots that's like heavily overlaid right so mm -hmm. for example um, the poles are typically like this, like a lot of images where it's just like layered on top of each other. In fact, one of my colleagues showed me an image of like all the little stripes that represents all the parts that Chrism like collected. Mm -hmm. um, but um, it looks like a bird's nest. Um, however, it's not that Chrism isn't like constantly like, you know, like gathering information like constantly. It's, um, they're, they're actually, I'm not saying there's not a lot of spots, but it's not overly populated with different spots. Sometimes you can request um, images from a particular spot, especially if it's like a high scientific interest, like for Jezero Crater. Mm -hmm. um, but nowadays we can't really do that because Chrism is like getting really, really old. And so, oh. um, yeah, it's 15 years old. That's like- That's old in instrument life or years, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, Miche, thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, sorry, do you have something else to that that you were saying? No, I was just rambling. <laughs> well, I, I think we're, I'm gonna have one more question for you at the very end, but everyone, can we give Miche a really, really big uh, Zoom applause in the chat for that wonderful presentation? It was awesome. Thank you so much, Miche. And then mm -hmm. audience again, thank you so much for your questions as well. Jay, you're up next and you're gonna tell us about your work a bit further out in the solar system with Saturn's moon Enceladus. Hey, thank you. Yes, so this is a mission concept study. There has not been a mission to Enceladus. Um, so this is a fairly new project for my lab and I'm going to talk about some of the, the real challenges involved in even doing a mission study. And I'd like you to think about whether you think such a mission is feasible and whether you think we should go to Enceladus. So next slide, please. Enceladus is the moon of Saturn, so it's twice as far away as Jupiter. It's actually got right now an hour and a half light speed delay each way. So you can imagine trying to relay data back and forth from your instruments is going to be fairly inconvenient. It's a very small moon, so its escape velocity is only 200 meters per second, as opposed to say 11 kilometers per second for the Earth. So very small. And the Cassini mission revealed these massive plumes of water ice emerging from this cracked region, the so-called tiger stripes, which you can see on this sort of lower right part of, of Enceladus. And these water ices contain absolutely every ingredient that we know is sufficient for life or necessary for life except phosphorus. So we're not quite sure about phosphorus, but if you think back to your freshman bio class, you might have been, you might have learned the mnemonic, C. Hopkins Cafe Mighty Good. And that's a mnemonic for all of the, um, all of the ingredients that are necessary for life. It's carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, potassium, nitrogen, calcium, magnesium. So that's the cafe part and iron. The cafe is calcium and iron and then magnesium. So everything except phosphorus is there. The water solution is compatible with life as we know it. 
And so at first it was postulated that there was just a pocket of water, of liquid water under a fairly thin ice shell, but now it's believed that there's a global water ocean. And in this artist's rendition, you see, you know, Enceladian jellyfish. So we don't think that there are jellyfish. We think that they are quite likely bacteria. So next slide, please. So if there are bacteria, can we get hold of them? And can we get hold of them on a budget? That's also the real issue. Every time you land something on another planet, it's going to cost 10 to 100 times more than if you just fly by. There are a lot of reasons for that. I won't go into the details, but let's assume we can all we can do is a flyby. But remember that your escape velocity is only 200 meters per second. So you could transect these plumes at about 200 meters per second. And you could fly round and round and round this moon dozens of times, maybe even hundreds of times, flying through the plumes each time. Now, you may think, OK, these plumes are really thick and potentially dense with material. They're not really. They're about as dense as, as a cloud, an ordinary cloud. So you really are not going to get a lot of stuff. So this is the mission feasibility study. How many times would you have to fly through? Is this feasible at all? If you have this collector flying through the plumes of Enceladus at 200 meters per second, could you capture anything alive? So say there were bacteria in the ocean. Are they going to get entrained into the plumes, first of all? Are they going to get rise as high as they need to be to be captured by your flyby? And then are they still going to be alive? Now, the last part isn't absolutely 100% necessary, but it sure would be nice. Next, please. So we'd like to simulate the plumes. And there have been a variety of studies trying to simulate the plumes of Enceladus, but none of them have contained bacteria. A lot of them have contained organic molecules. But we'd like to see if we could actually make simulated plumes of Enceladus that contain bacteria. So first of all, how big do those ice grains need to be? And how do you get the bacteria inside? We'll have to then accelerate those ice grains up to 200 meters per second, capture them in some sort of a substrate, and then deliver it to a variety of instruments, see if they're still alive, see if we can still recognize them as cells. Next, please. So the field of bioaerosols has helped us, helped us a lot in terms of just generating the ice grains. And there's been a lot more research in the past couple of years on bioaerosols than probably in the past 25 years before that due to COVID and the concern about respiratory droplets and spread of COVID. And there's some very interesting things that go on when you talk about bacterial cells or viruses getting trapped in water droplets or ice grains. And that's that some cells actually tend to be more concentrated in a small bubble than they are in the initial bulk solution. So say if you have an ocean wave breaking and it contains Vibrio cholerae, the agent that causes cholera, the little droplets that come out of the ocean spray are going to have more Vibrio cholera in them than the bulk water. Yes, so this is a serious problem in terms of the spread of certain diseases, but it's not true for all bacteria. Interestingly enough, the ones that tend to be red are ones that concentrate more in bubbles than ones that are not red. There's something about the red pigment, which is called prodigiosin. And so this phenomenon is called bubble scrubbing. It's not well understood in a general rule. As a general rule, we'd like to understand it. And there's even less research on putting bacteria into ice, never mind liquid aerosol. So if you make a liquid aerosol and then you freeze it, what happens to the cells? Nobody really knows. Next, please. OK, so we want to make ice grains, not just droplets. So thanks to the bioaerosol research, we're able to make a variety of droplets using a variety of methods, everything from just your kitchen spray bottle going, psh, psh, but that's kind of big. These are sort of 100 micron scale droplets. We use neb nebulizers of various kinds to make smaller droplets, ones just barely bigger than a cell, which is about a micron. And then we just take these spritzers and we spritz them into this bucket full of liquid nitrogen. And this flash freezes them. And so then the question is, how do you look at them without that melting? So glass has got a terrible thermal conductivity. You put them in a glass slide, these things are just going to melt, no matter how cold your microscope is. So you have to get a sapphire slide. You put them on a sapphire slide, and then you take this whole microscope into a minus 15 degree walk-in cold room. Let me tell you, this is miserable, trying to take those pictures. You're taking your glove, 
putting your glove on, taking it off to take the picture, quick, put your glove back on, use the other hand. So it's, it's pretty miserable, but we can get pictures. And you can see here the size and shape of the ice grains and these little brighter green spots are the cells inside. Next, please. Hazard pay, yeah, for the coal, exactly. And now the question is how to accelerate them. So we can charge the grains and accelerate them, but this can sometimes kill the cells. We can also just try shooting them with a BB gun. So a lot of this high speed bacterial impact work has been done at the University of Kent using hypervelocity guns, so kilometers per second. We're just talking about 200 meters per second. So again, um, this is really something that happens with, you know, that, that you can achieve with just a BB gun. So, and the advantage of a BB gun is we don't need a permit for it. So we have a cold box and we're just starting trying to do this now. You have a pile of little ice grains and a collimator so that you collect the ice grains that are just traveling forward at the muzzle velocity of the gun and trying to shoot these ice grains into a target. So we haven't yet got it so that we can evacuate this box. So it's a vacuum. It's currently just in air. So that, you know, the ice grains tend to melt a little bit, but at least it's a start. Next, please. Okay, so in order to get the bacteria to be alive when you catch them, you have to cushion them in some way. If you shoot them directly onto ice or onto plastic, the cells all die. And so we discovered that early on with some experiments with serratia marcescens, which as I mentioned, the red ones, bubble scrub. So serratia is bright red, really easy to see. And we took various tubes and put a variety of things in them, plain ice, medium filled with, with ice and frozen, and then agar and various other soft media that were then frozen to liquid nitrogen temperatures and the bacteria impacted them. And what we found is that anything containing agar or any other type of hydrogel of that sort, even if it's frozen to liquid nitrogen temperatures, when the bacteria hit it, they grow just beautifully. So this one on the right is frozen agar and, and the um, serratia marcescens impacted it at about 200 meters per second. And you can see they really are quite happy and growing. So we would like to have a collection funnel of some sort with the biggest possible surface area to, again, remember those plumes of Enceladus are absolutely not very dense. They're like a cloud, biggest possible surface area, but lined with something like agar so that when it hits the vacuum and the cold of space, it creates some sort of surface that the bacteria are not killed by on impact, but then also which ideally we can remelt and get into the throat of the funnel and then deliver to a microscopic system so that we can analyze the bacteria by a variety of methods. Next, please. So we have a variety of space-worthy instruments for imaging. This is a microscope that we're developing to fly in the International Space Station in a couple of years. It's a digital holographic microscope, which is an interferometer. Actually, it's an interferometric microscope. It inter takes the pattern of interference between a light wave that refracts around an object and a reference wave and creates an interference pattern, which gives you an image. Next, please. And so we've done a lot of work trying to make this microscope worthy of space because it's simple, it's no moving parts. Remember trying to focus with an hour and a half light speed delay is probably not going to happen. There's no moving parts, large volume of view and fairly high spatial resolution with built-in data compression. Next, please. So this is what the instrument looks like on the bench top. Next, please. And we've taken it to a variety of places. And this is really the fun part of my work is that we get to go and test this out in a variety of extreme environments on Earth. This is an example of Axel Heiberg Island in Nunavut, Canada at about 80 degrees north latitude. And most of what you're seeing is not ice, it's gypsum. But there are glaciers there as well. And we have some glacier ice. Next, please. And if you melt glacier ice, even if it's thousands of years old, you always find something in it that's alive. So you thaw the glacier ice overnight and what you can see is really pretty much as amazing as anything Leeuwenhoek ever saw and gives you no doubt as to there being something alive in there. Next, please.
And so lately with COVID shutdowns, we haven't been able to travel internationally. So we're looking for a variety of Mars and, and or um, yeah, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn moon analog sites. And this is just one in Mount St. Helens that we've recently been studying because there's not really known about a lot known about what's going on with the microorganisms in the crater of Mount St. Helens. There have been very few studies since the eruption in 1980, but here you have an ecosystem that's exactly 42 years old. So very interesting from the point of view of, of evolutionary biology. And so that is my presentation. Thank you so much, Jay. So we actually, you mentioned COVID and we have a question about that already, which um, Minaj from Toronto is wondering, I think in reference to the bubble scrubbing or clumping phenomenon you were talking about, but does this happen with COVID? And if so, you know, can this teach us anything about reducing viral loads from a COVID exposure? Yeah, so I don't think we know. And mm -hmm. um, the bubble sp scrubbing experiments are fairly hard to do with, even with bacteria. They would be mm -hmm. even harder to do with viruses because the thing with bacteria is you can catch them on a petri dish and then count mm -hmm. the number of colonies and it's really easy to do this is a lot harder to do with viruses and i've been doing a lot of thinking about how you would do that experiment with viruses like you could for example have a plate full viruses will not grow on just medium they need cells mm -hmm. so if you had say a bacteriophage that infects bacteria you could have a plate covered with bacteria you could put it there and you could have the viruses impact the plate but again, it's it's just so much harder because they're that much smaller and you can't count them under the microscope. So I would love to do this experiment, but it's going to take some thought. Mm -hmm. Well, and speaking um, more experiments, or if, if we ever do get to the point where we can scoop up uh, maybe bacteria from the plumes of Enceladus, uh, Lou, Lewis in New York City is wondering, and actually speaking the Mars Explorer, it's collecting samples to be retrieved and brought back to Earth in a future mission. Isn't this dangerous as we don't really know what is in Martian soil or the plumes of Enceladus, uh, Andromeda strain, anyone? Ex exclamation point, question mark. That is a really great question. And my personal view is that it's very unlikely that something from another planet is going to infect us, that the things that tend to be really pathogenic for humans come from our closest relatives. So chimpanzees, for example. But, on, but with that said, all of the spacefaring nations have agreed to be extremely careful with anything that's returned. And so the idea is any sample return would have to be studied in what's called the biosafety level five facility. So even more extreme than the biosafety level four that you use to look at say something like um, Ebola virus. Mm -hmm. So biosafety level five would be designed to keep you safe but also keep it completely safe mm -hmm. so that you can't cross forward contaminate it and mistake earth life for Enceladian life. Um, where such a facility would be is still up for debate. I think the city of Cambridge, Massachusetts said, uh-uh, no way, not happening here. But various towns in Canada have said, oh yeah, let's do it here because there's absolutely <laughs> nothing around for mm -hmm. thousands of miles. But I mean, that's the idea that if you actually bring it all the way back, it's going to take some extreme containment. That's why we don't ex anticipate bringing anything back. We anticipate looking at it in orbit and then having the spacecraft probably not even come back. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm picturing a, like a new, a, a reboot of the thing uh, in, in yes. a town in Canada. Not when, that, we again. Are in, when we are in the Arctic, we always have to watch the thing. <laughs> it's a good choice. Well, and you know, you've been talking about proving an experimental concept and, and learning on earth in order to do experimentation in space. Like what are the steps that, you know, to, to taking your instrument and proving that it'll do what you need it to do and then actually like launching it physically into space like what kind of concerns go into that um you know you've talked about some but you know it's like microgravity or the cold of the vacuum something that changes some of your sort of an engineering design considerations yeah that's a really terrific question there is a scale that nasa uses that's called trl and it stands for technology readiness level and it means how ready you are to go into space so basically trl1 means this thing hasn't been built, it's just an idea in your head. TRL-9 means it's been to Mars already. So it's everywhere sort of in between and you can propose an instrument to a mission if it's around TRL-6. Okay. And so basically it's, you have to test things in realistic environments on earth and then they have to develop some sort of flight heritage. And so that's why we wanna to go to the ISS in a couple of years is really to develop this flight heritage and figure out if 
our instrument can withstand launch, can function in microgravity and all of those questions. And so all of those types of experiments are steps on the way to making, making any instrument mission worthy. Mm -hmm. Jay, thank you so much for this presentation. Please, uh, everyone give Jay a round of applause in the chat real quick. Uh, again, big Zoom <laughs> round of applause. And then I wanna bring Miche Aaron back for one last question for both of you. Um, so Miche, uh, feel free to unmute yourself too. And, and this is about future instruments and sort of um, what's on your wish list slash, shop, slash shopping list. Um, is there something that doesn't exist yet um, maybe it's in science fiction, maybe it's like the tricorder from Star Trek that you can just, you know, point at something and it'll tell you what everything is. Um, or maybe it's just a concept that uh, hasn't been fully refined, but what do you wish you had to make your research even more uh, seamless in, in sort of the steps between data collection and data interpretation? And Jay, why don't you go first? Yeah, so I would love to have an electron microscope that works in space. And there have been various <laughs> designs, but there really isn't one. And given that a lot of places you have sort of free vacuum and electron microscopes operate in vacuum, technically we could make one small enough and it would go and it would function. It just hasn't really been done, but boy, I would love that. Mm -hmm. Miche, what's in your dreams? So honestly, my dreams would be just a modified version of Prism. So the downside about Prism is that um, we don't see all of the absorptions, the detailed absorptions. So we see the major ones that help us identify it, but the detailed ones help us um, um, specifically identify the exact type of minerals, some different minerals, like even if it's like in the same group, right? So for example, mm -hmm. there's this group called polyhydrated sulfates. And mm -hmm. so polyhydrated just means that it has more than one water molecule in its structure. So, um, there are a lot of polyhydrated um, sulfates that exist in it's a big family. our mineral collection. It's a big family, yeah. <laughs> um, the specifics of which one, we can somewhat tell the difference between the iron one and the magnesium one, uh, mostly because with iron, again, that transition metal is gonna actually absorb, well, not absorb, yeah, it's gonna absorb that in that area where we're gonna see that iron, right? And the magnesium is just gonna be like less iron, right? But mm -hmm. I want to know the exact one, mm -hmm. and even and, and not only that, I kind of want to improve the pixel sizes too to make it super detailed, like high rise. So I guess you know, in, like increase the, um, the like I guess make the pixels smaller and then make the details more detailed, so I can really mm -hmm. figure things out instead of just having to like go the scenic route. Mm -hmm. So like Prism three point Yes, but I think we're we're trying to move on to other planets, which you know I'm okay with. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you both again so much, uh, everyone. I know your hands are tired of clapping virtually, but please give Miche and Jay one last round of applause in the chat. It was so great to hear about both of your amazing work, and we can't see what you get up to in the future. And audience, thank you. You were awesome. Your questions were awesome, making my job super easy. I barely had to think at all. Thank you all. Before we close, Diana has something to share with us. Welcome back, Diana. Hello, everyone. Thank you for welcoming me back for a quick uh, update. So everyone in the chat, uh, let us know some thoughts and feelings of when I said space technology or gadgets in space, I said, what did you think of? And I took what you thought, and I made this little word cloud out of it. Look, this is all the stuff that you thought. Of course, as we expected, a lot of you immediately rovers, robotic arms, which I also love, satellites. We got some other, like the smaller words mean you said it just once or a few times. So telescopes, diggers, orbiters, environmental sensors. But these are all like such cool stuff. You all came here with like really, really interesting things in mind when you think about space tech. But I'm hoping that Miche and Jay were able to give you sort of like an even bigger idea of what space tech could look like and will look like in the future. So uh, if you still have, if you have new thoughts, if you have ideas about what uh, space tech could be, um, put your thoughts in the chat now while, while we're wrapping up and there'll be a brief survey at the very end of this event when you close out that asks you for some more thoughts. So you can feel free to put them there. Uh, we would really appreciate uh, any more thoughts that you have now that you've seen a little bit more from our guest experts here today. So thank you in advance for doing that. I'm like super excited. <laughs> like, this is so cool. Like yeah. you guys mentioned stuff I didn't even expect. 
I am really excited to see Star Trek and Star Wars and like someone just made that three words. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just like all of the sci-fi stuff is what I think of. Mm-hmm. That's also what I think of too. I spend a lot of my free time with uh, with some sci-fi, either books or uh, with, with films. And so I'm happy that we're all in the same room together. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much, Diana. This is so cool. I'm so excited to see that final word cloud and and see what folks uh, latched onto from today. 